Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. From the right, I'm Gary Pollan. And from the left, I'm David Jones. This week on Red, White, and Blue, the 14th Congressional District, a United States House of Representatives race, Republican primary. Joining us tonight are the following Republican candidates. First, Michael Truncali, who's a partner with Orgain, Bell, and Tucker. Next, Pearland City Council member Felicia Harris. And finally, Texas Representative Randy Weber, who represents District 29 in the State House. Welcome to all three of you. Thank you for having me. Okay, us. first thing we're going to do, uh, and usually David gets the first question, but he's gonna, he gave me the privilege of asking first. I want you to tell me a little bit about yourselves, introducing yourself to the to our viewers. Okay. Start with you, Randy. You're the closest to me. Super. Uh, I am 58 years old. I've lived in a five-mile radius 18 years all my life in the top half of Missouri County. I'm an air conditioning contractor. I'm a small business owner. I've been an active Republican since 1983 when Ronald Reagan ran for re-election. been precinct chair, election clerk, election judge. I was on Pearland City Council for six years, elected to the state legislature in 2008. I'm married to the prettiest gal this side of the Atlantic, Gary. We've been married 35 years. Uh, we, we have three wonderful kids and four wonderful grandchildren. Okay, and why are you running for Congress? You got a great job in Austin and, and being an air conditioning contractor. That, that's a great question, Gary. <clears throat> I love what I do in the Texas House. I really do. I got the number one conservative rating my very first term in the legislature. I love representing, and my district, by the way, overlaps Congressional District 14 right now, so I currently represent people in this district. I love representing these fine uh, citizens that we have in this area. I've grown up in this area, built my business in this area. When Ron and Paul announced he wasn't going to run for re-election, my phone started ringing. Weber, you need to run for this. And that was my question to them, Gary. Why would I want to step out of the Texas state legislature and run for this? And they said, take your solid conservative Christian business values up the ladder a notch and fight for us in D.C. Gotcha. Okay, Felicia, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running. Happy to. Thank you. Well, I'm a native Texan and a lifelong Republican. I, I'm actually the daughter of small business owners. My mother had a maid service cleaning business that she ran out of her house for a number of years as I was growing up, and my father was a salesman uh, for his career. I remember when my mother would pick me up from school and, and take me to clean vacant apartments and homes, and that's how I learned a strong work ethic and the value of integrity and dreams. I, my parents were fortunate enough to be able to send me to Texas A&M University, where I graduated in 1992 with honors, and following that, moved to the Gulf Coast region and couldn't find a job. So I started selling cars in the Gulf Coast region until I found a job with Coca-Cola, actually selling Coca-Cola in Brazoria County and in Galveston County, two of the counties in District 14. I did that until I, I was accepted to law school, and I started taking law school classes at night, part-time at South Texas College of Law. I uh, put myself through law school, graduated first in my class in 1997, and that opened up a new world for me. I was able to accept a position with Chief Justice John Casey in the Fort Worth Court of Appeals, and uh, as a briefing attorney, I worked for him for a year and then came back down to the Gulf Coast region and worked in the private sector representing a number of energy and petrochemical uh, employers, pharmaceutical employers, and financial services employers, as well as some mom-and-pop companies who do business in the Gulf Coast region. Um, long story short, uh, last summer I decided to resign from the partnership of a national law firm and this country is in a world of hurt. I believe our president is killing the American dream, which I've actually lived. I'm 42 years old, and uh, I'm the youngest and have the honor and pleasure of being the only female in this race. And this, this country right now needs leadership in this district. This district is the energy backbone of Texas. It is the Gulf Coast region. It includes offshore and onshore energy uh, companies and employers who have been hit hard by this current administration uh, in the gut, if you will, and a lot of people have lost their jobs and are fighting mad about it, and I'd love to represent them in D.C. Great. And Michael Trincali, tell us about yourself and why you're running. Thank you. It's good to be here. I'm Michael Trincali. I was born in the district. I've lived virtually my entire life in this congressional district. I'm a son of educators, and I'm a dedicated family man. My wife of more than 30 years, and I have two children. My youngest daughter, in fact, is a nursing student at UTMB in Galveston. I'm a lifelong conservative Republican, which is remarkable given the fact that I was born and raised here in this congressional district. I'm not a politician, however. I've been active in the Republican Party all of my life. In fact, uh, in 1984, Denise and I were at the Republican convention when we heard Ronald Reagan take his second term, and we came back to work with others in this district to build the Republican Party. I've been a precinct chair, I'm on the state Republican executive committee, and I've been a delegate to the national convention. I've also been a university regent and appointed by Senator Cornyn and Hutchison to the Federal Judicial Selection Committee. That's the group that screens candidates for federal judgeships. As I said, I'm not a politician, never aspired to be a politician. 
Constitution, I consider myself a citizen taxpayer. You see, my grandfather came to Jefferson County over 100 years ago. He worked at the Texaco refinery for 70 cents a day. And then he was able to start his own small business. And he knew that the promise of America is that everyone is entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, not life, liberty, and the redistribution of wealth. And my grandmother, who only had a second grade education, taught me and all her grandchildren, you're not entitled to anything unless you work for it. I'm running for Congress because Washington is broken. Government is too big and it exercises too much control over our lives. And that is a good beginning to my, to my uh, inquiry, uh, Michael Troncali. I'll start with you because you said on your website you just oppose liberalism and socialism. So I'm going to give you a chance to tell us all what that means by addressing Ms. Harris here because she once worked for a firm. Uh, that represented AIG, who got $200 billion of government money in the fall of 2008. That was an 80% ownership interest in a bank, at which is, time Mr. Paulson described that we're all socialists. So tell us now what you mean when you oppose socialism. Well, tell Ms. Harris. Well, well, for the record, I never represented AIG, yeah. so I, I don't Your know. Your firm did. My, my firm may have, but I did not. They, in fact, the firm sued the government to get a refund of taxes. When okay. I was in college at Lamar University, my undergraduate degree is in economics, I was president of an organization called Students for Free Enterprise. That was in the 70s. And we were advocating for our free market system because we know our, our free enterprise system provides more opportunities for people than any other economic system in the world. I went on and got an MBA, studied economics at the graduate level with Dick Armey, a free market economist. And then I worked as a financial analyst in Dallas before my wife put me through the SMU School of Law. So, Ms. Harris, is taxing and spending socialism? So, socialism is a system of, of economics where the government owns private property rights and dictates to the, to the individual, the taxpayer, what they can and cannot do with that property right. And that is exactly what's going on in this country right now. We've got a president who is dictating to the private sector how they can and cannot use their private property. In this case, it is the industries that drive jobs in this district. And it, it's appalling to me. So socialism, in my view, is the opposite of capitalism, which is where individuals own private property and have the, the ability to succeed or to fail based on their own decisions. And that's the, the free market system as we know it, and that's the free market system that's made this country and, strong. And to be fair, you should have a chance to rebut David's accusations well, well, and, against, and, your, and, against you on behalf of your law firm. Uh, about she just did. Well, 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 the truth is, is I I'm no longer with a law firm, so whatever those accusations are are irrelevant. But moreover, I never represented AIG. and know nothing about the matter or who represented them. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think it's irrelevant. Companies are entitled to representation. So Obama's a, Obama's a dictator. That makes him a socialist. Is that your position? No, not exactly. What, what makes him a socialist is the fact that he's imposing policies on, on this country, which are taking away our private property rights and threatening our freedoms. Our economy in the last three and a half years has not, has not succeeded at all. In fact, since he's been president, the unemployment rate has never been below 8%. Moreover, gas prices, a, a gallon of gasoline now costs more than double what it did when he took office. And in large part, all of those uh, uh, problems with our economy are driven by his policies. You add to that the fact that two key driving sectors in this Gulf Coast region are the healthcare sector and the energy sector. And he has taken a punch in the gut to both of those in his three and a half years in office. Yeah. And people have lost their jobs. I think it's it. fair to say at least four of us agree he's no fan of Texas. Exactly. Ronald, Ronald Reagan had it right when he said, what's the difference between the West and the East? And this was before the Berlin Wall fell. He said, if you go to an American youth and say, what do you want to be, he'll tell you his or her dreams. But behind the Iron Curtain, in a communist country or socialist country, the answer from a youth is, I don't know. They haven't told me. And that's a fundamental difference. What we live here under are the freedoms we have in our Constitution from Adam Smith on, the very basis of our economy, private property ownership, be all you can be has provided the greatest opportunities for individuals like my grandfather, who was poor, to uh, overcome poverty. In the other countries, the planned economies where government controls everything, that's the root of socialism. Yeah, well, let's and get Randy in this. Yeah, yeah. Let's get Randy in this. Sure. Sure. Not picture. necessarily to address socialism. No. But, you know, Actually, I sure. wanted to ask Randy about tax reform. That was on your website. You favor tax reform. Okay. Tell us what tax reform well, you favor. Well, before we do, I want to chime in with what Michael said about growing up poor. I grew up on a p farm that was so poor it took three acres just to rust one nail. <laughs> so now that's poor, okay? That is poor. Uh, but let me, I, I do want to address that socialism thing. Ronald Reagan also said that socialism only works in two places. Hell, heaven where they don't need it, and hell where they've already got it. 
And then Margaret Thatcher said the problem with socialism, David, is that you always run out of other people's money. In my particular instance, being a small business owner, I didn't grow up watching somebody do a business. I started an air conditioning company from scratch and didn't have any any background in air conditioning. Went, I had a degree from the University of Houston at Clear Lake, went back to Alvin Junior College where I met my bride of 35 years, took air conditioning and refrigeration courses and hung out my shingle. Yesterday I couldn't spell AC and today I are one. And I built that rascal from the ground up and it was tough. And it was hard. I paid for my own college. I paid for my tuition. I paid for my books. We didn't take out loans. Brenda finished her school during the day on Wednesday when I kept our first baby, and I finished mine at night. And I built Weber's Air and Heat. That's, that's the American capitalistic way. Nobody bailed out Weber's Air and Heat. Nobody bought my tuition or my books. I did it all because I had a dream and I had a goal. And that's the American way. Next question. Well, no, you're, you have two committees. Uh, Randy has two committees that he's serving on, on the well, House of Representatives. But before we get to that, oh. I want to. The tax reform is something very important to the yeah. American people. He chose not to tell you anything. About he actually that. was ready to, and when, when you interrupted him. Right. So I go see. ahead. Yeah. I want to hear what's your tax reform plan. You well, get to Congress, and each, each year you're going to get you, to respond. You know, Gary, that in Texas, being a member of the te- I love being a member of the Texas Legislature because we get it in Texas. We cut our budget. Our budget was $27 billion with the B dollars less than it was the session before. $12 billion of that was stimulus, or what I call spin from us money, some of that money that maybe some on the left might be proud of. $15 billion of what was our budget. Texas gets it. We made a pledge, many of us did, Republicans, solid conservative Republicans running for re-election or for the first time, that we would not raise taxes for the shortfall, we would not increase fees, and we didn't. We've got to get, we have a spending problem, as you know, not a revenue problem with the federal government. We've got to get the taxing structure fixed. There's a lot of talk about fair tax. There's a lot of talk about a flat tax, and I've been studying them both. But it's not, more tax, as you know, is not the answer. We get it in Texas. Small business people get it in Texas. These guys in D.C., I'm not sure about we want to cut spending. It's time to cut up Congress's credit card. I have that record in the state legislature. Y'all are certainly we'll, free to talk yeah, about we'll that. We'll do it. I, I, I thought is, you might want to address we, whether or not the border is secured. Well, Mr. We'll Weber is on, uh, uh, he's in, uh, on the border committee, and he's on public education. Why don't you tell us whether the border is secure and whether, well, you know, like we well, don't have eighth graders getting uh, college a, education. We've got to deal with the real issues here. We're already out of money. We're over close to $16 trillion in debt. And I'm going to tell you, that tre- is go- debt is going to hurt our children. It's going to hurt our economy. And it will destabilize our currency. We've got to get spending under control. That's why I stand for a balanced budget amendment to the United States Constitution. I simply don't trust Congress or any future Congress to cut spending without one. And that's with that kind of restraint that we have in Texas, that's how we've been able to force agencies to cut spending here in Texas. It's because of the balanced budget requirement that we have here. And with regard to taxes, we know that taxes must stay low and fair because we know that if businesses can depend and individuals can depend on a low tax rate for the as far as they can see, they will invest in private businesses, build small businesses. Yeah, well, that's, that's certainly the not backbone. the case well, for what we have now, is it, Felicia? Well, it is, it is absolutely not the case. But, you know, here, no. here's the thing. I, I think I think the federal government has lost their, their focus on what they're supposed to be focusing on. It is to... to work within the confines of the Constitution. I actually am on the city council for the city of Pearland, and I've seen from 2006 to today the, the downturn in the economy and how it affects individuals, and I felt it firsthand because I actually have a responsibility to the citizens to balance a budget as well, and we've done it every single year. And since the decline in the economy, we've had to cut millions of dollars out of our own budget. Why? Because uh, the housing market went to heck in a handbasket, and people's values went down, but the services needed to, to, to still be provided. Ms. Harris, when did all this start? This, this all this government out of control stuff. It, it started years ago, and we've, we've been asleep at the wheel for a number of years. Both you know, sides. It, when, did, when was the budget last in surplus? Do you, can you answer that one? I, I, I'm not familiar with that statistic. That would be 2000 when Bill Clinton was president. But, but here's here's the surplus. point now with with tax After reform right now. Republican we absolutely Congress. have to have. <laughs> We have to have legislatures who have transparency. Right now, I think the American public is scratching their head wondering, what is going on in D.C.? And there's, there's all these moving parts. And that's why I think everyone is so up in arms right now and why Ron Paul is such a strong following, because he's actually exposing some of what we wonder about going on in D.C. And in this district, we've got people who love Ron Paul. We have a lot of people who have kept up with what's going on. They're educated. They're smart. They want a representative who's going to go up there and continue to, to uh, pursue transparent government 
and also try to balance the budget because absolutely we have a spending problem, but we need people who know how to do that and who are willing to work with others across all of the aisles to do it because we're all Americans to be. So what with. would have happened if we had uh, Mr. Troncali's balance balance budget amendment well, I can we, say, when, when the Saint economy went in the tank and George Bush started yes. spending we're billions have of to dollars? Make some Where would we have been if we had a balanced budget amendment? If we had, a, we're going to have to balance the budget. We're going to, have to we, live within we, our means like we, we do not. every day at our homes and our kitchen tables. Just like when, in Texas. When we have, just like in Texas. When we do it in the city of Pearland, when you do it we in your you. house, too. You, money does not grow on trees. It you. never has. It never will. And, and bear in mind, it's the threat of higher taxes that's hurting businesses because that's what's keeping people on the sidelines from investing in small businesses. And we learned under the Reagan administration, it's called the Laffler Curve, mm -hmm. that if you keep taxes low, you actually stimulate the economy. There are more people employed. That's something we need to do now with our high unemployment rate. You get the economy going, and you actually get more tax revenue to the federal government, which helps reduce the debt. But the first thing you must do is stop the ridiculous spending. Cut that spending, and that's where that's the, well, that's that's the well, beginning to the answer. Well, two parts to that, because mm -hmm. you absolutely have the tax prong, but there's also the prong of overregulation. In this, in this district, overregulation is as big of a factor, probably even a bigger factor, than taxes, because what you've got are, are, are uh, employers who are regulated by the EPA. The president is circumventing Congress and passing rules, which have the effect of law when implemented, upon these, these employers. And I've talked to them. I've asked them, what is the biggest driving force behind the decisions that you make or don't make in your industries? And they say it is the uncertainty created by the overregulation, how we're going to advance our industries and expand our network of employees and markets, both nationally, regionally, and internationally. We have to That's talk about the, the biggest By the way, we well, have to talk about the social issues, well, guys, sure because, well, well, you know, well, well, you know well, which is exactly in. why... And, uh, we, do we need a balanced budget amendment? Yes, but we don't have time because it can take four, five, six, seven years to get through the, through, the, uh, through the process. We've got to cut up Congress's credit card right now. We've got to get people up there with backbone that'll stand up and say, no, enough's enough. No more spending. Did you say no to the federal dollars that ba help us balance the budget? Le whenever te uh, Texas was in the tank let me, uh, let me three years what, ago? Let me tell you what happened, David. Who said no well, to the, well, to well, the federal well, dollar well, that helped us well, balance Rick budget. Perry said no to race to the top money, 550-something million dollars. I stood beside him at that press conference and said, we reject those federal dollars because they want a control of our curriculum. Yes, they would give us 550, give us the free money, quote, unquote, but that was 550-something million dollars, if I remember correctly. And you had Gail Fallon, president of the Houston Teachers uh, Union, the largest probably union in Texas, t Teachers Union, and uh, the president of TCTA, and her name escapes me. When you've got two of those standing up beside the governor and saying, we're with you, governor, we're rejecting that money, th you know something's going on. We knew that federal dollars come with strings attached. Now, what we didn't like, David, was when we were in the legislature in the 81st session, they brought in 15 billion, I'm sorry, 12 billion dollars worth of stimulus money. And Obama's no fool. He's smart. He went and gave the money to TEA, to TxDOT, to HHSC. Now, I'm not, I may not be the world's greatest government student, but I understand that the Texas legislature is charged with doing the budget for Texas. And we're, rep and we're elected by the people that, we're, that we represent. We set the budget. He went around us. And he gave money to those agencies. Pretty smart because he's buying votes. There's that dictator again. Now, <laughs> Ms. Harris, the social issues yes. are part of every campaign in a Republican primary, as we know. Do you have any problems with Mr. Weber here who supported the sonogram bill, which has outraged so many women in the state of Texas and in the uh, country? Well, I mean, I I'm outraged that the Democrats are saying vicious lies and distorting the truth. The Republicans do not have a war on women. Uh, it, it is, and, and I'm also appalled at the fact that they say things like conservative values disadvantage women in America. The truth is, uh, I'm the only candidate in this race who can go toe to toe with every single Democrat in Washington D.C. Even the liberal women spokespersons that they put out there, like Deborah Wasserman Schultz and Nancy Pelosi, and effectively contrast our conservative, limited government, cohesive values, and juxtapose those against the big government socialist viewpoint that they're pushing on the American people right now. And so what we have right now is a situation where our government is, is making a big deal out of women's issues when they need to be focused on the real issues, the economic issues. And so, uh, you know, we have to have positions on social issues because it's part of a campaign. But the fact of the matter is, is I'm the only candidate in this race that can effectively address some of those issues. Moreover, the, the issues that drive the debate are really economic. Those are the ones women want the same thing that men want. We want to have security in our, in our financial positions. We want to have security in our relationships. Also we want to have one, good jobs and everything else. You're also the only one who could be forced to have a vaginal ultrasound. Okay? Only, you're the, you're only, the only, only one on the Only if the, the federal government 
ignores the Constitution because the Constitution doesn't give the federal government the right. And I would stand up and abhor that kind of, of law because the federal government doesn't have a right to be in any person's bedroom, much less a woman's, or in any person's uh, hospital room. It is absolutely off limits under the Constitution of the United States. So that and makes the federal you pro-choice then? No, yeah. I am pro-life, 100%. In fact, I was married for over 15 years, and I tried to have a family, and I could not. I am absolutely 100% pro-life. But I do not believe the federal government has any role at federal all government. in a woman's bedroom. Well, and I would suggest that, you know, social issues are not just pertinent to this campaign. They're per pertinent to every day in life. And for the conservative Republican Party in this country, social issues are important. Well, I want to add that I am pro-life, and I'm uh, proud to say that I'm pro-life, pro-traditional family values. But I also am a believer in the, in the Constitution, and I think the First Amendment rights of Catholics in this country are being a bridge. I think it is unconstitutional and inappropriate that the federal government would tell the Catholic Church what they can and cannot do with regard to contraceptives. And once you start chiseling away on the First Amendment or on the Second Amendment or any of the other liberties we share, we're on a slippery slope. Well, you, all, 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 what all they're doing is using yeah. women as a subterfuge for an attack on religious liberties. Exactly. And, and that's appalling. And if they get away with attacking a religious liberty successfully, then nobody well, let, let, will be examined. Let, let, let's let's not lose sight here. Religious liberties, yes, Michael brought it up. But it's broader than than that because anytime they tell a business thou shalt pay for anything it's going to be free contraception we fought this battle on the floor of the house you know we defunded Planned Parenthood 64 million dollars I carried the very first amendment on the floor and it was a battle we were successful for the federal government to come in and tell and that's important social issues are important. So now to we're going to have more unwanted children because of no, because well, of Planned Parenthood you started as a baby right <laughs> I, I presume okay. that I uh, were you, know, you that unwanted. There, there may have been some missed opportunities yeah. okay. for me. I think I, there may I, have been regret me, later. I, I will say that. Let me be the first to bring up the biggest yeah. federal overreach of all, and the thing that's going to further put us into bankruptcy, and that's Obamacare. It must be overturned. Let me tell you, if Obamacare is allowed to stand, mm -hmm. there's no limit to what the federal government can do to you, and it is going to put government in your hospital room or in your medical room putting you between you and your doctor making your decisions. Sure, it's going it to lead to government rationing. Politicians making medical decisions. Exactly. Well, but I'm going to talk about I'm he's, he's making it. the point that I just made for the it, government to yeah. tell any business anything. It's not just about religious liberties. It's broader than this. Broader than Obamacare. It is massive federal overreach. We fought it, for state rights in the Texas House. I'll do it in Congress. It, it's a very simple matter. The federal government is ignoring the Constitution under Obama's leadership. And, and, and in doing so, it is taking away our freedoms and our liberties, the things that people have lost their lives for in this country and the things that we want to fight for again. And we need a voice in Washington, D.C., who's going to stand up to them and who can do it effectively. And in this race, because women have been the subterfuge for these attacks on religious liberties, I feel I'm the only one who can do it effectively and to do it from a position of not just a campaign rhetorical speech, I read your but advocacy. I can do it. I can do it from personal experience. You have you advocated that in your website, where you said Absolutely. you want to dismantle decades of social engineering. I guess that includes Medicare and Medicaid and how many other things. No, going now, back now you're putting words in my mouth. Now you're putting words in my mouth. We our our, what do you want to our government has put has made some promises to individuals who are who are in the retirement years, and I absolutely believe, and this is on my website too, that those who have made who in that retirement age, 55 and older, should should receive the benefits the government promised to them. However, those of us who are younger, we have an opportunity to plan for our future, and there's and there are three pinnacles in my view, that this government stands upon, that we as Americans stand upon in terms of our own personal liberties. It's individual liberty, it's personal responsibility, and a limited government. And with those three pinnacles, our country has been able to forge more freedom and more prosperity than any other nation in the entire world. You don't just backtrack on promises from the federal government. You put plan and prepare ahead. But we as Americans have, have certain positions of individual liberty, personal responsibility, and limited government that help us be who we are, and they're under attack right now, severely. I well, want to talk about how, how wait, wait EPA... A minute, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to talk about securing our borders. Uh, in a recent statewide poll, number one issue among Republican primary voters was uh, illegal immigration. So who wants first at that? I'll take it. I'm vice chairman of the Borders Committee, okay? I've missed two candidates for them in this race because I was doing my job, one standing in McAllen and more recently over at Fort Hood where we had committee hearings. Texas is working diligently to secure the border. It is not our responsibility per se. The federal government, David, has abdicated its responsibility. 
They are not securing the border. Obama came to El Paso and he announced the border is safe. Let me tell you something. And as it's a, safe in El Paso. Well, it, it was when you're, I guess if you have your own no, Secret Service detail, Bullets except for those. Shot at University of Texas El Paso uh, David, across you, the border. David, if you have your own Secret Service detail, then it's safe around you unless they're the guys that go out into South America and bring in <laughs> unwanted women necessarily. 30 seconds of one word answers. Okay. Uh, did you support Ron Paul in the presidential primary? Quickly. Or someone else. We, no, we haven't been on the vote yet. yet. Well, well, did you, you could, no, we you haven't been on the vote yet. Did you pick anybody yet in the no. presidential primary? No. no. I will no tell you this. Ron Paul endorsed me in my last two state rep races. Okay. How about that? Well, well Ron yeah. Paul is not endorsing anybody in this race. I know that for a fact. I've asked. And, uh, and listen. Quickly, we must secure the borders. Mr. We, must, we must stop the magnet that draws in. Thank you for but, being here, sir. Mr. Harris we must and have. Randy Weber. Okay. okay. <laughs> it was <We> fun. We invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Click on the local program bar red white and blue watch the shows watch a follow-up discussion and until next time get informed and get active